Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the tragic murder of 19 year old Kenya Monhe. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new Morbid Makeup video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both Brat or Seen, but no pressure. So guess what, guys? Today's video is sponsored by Dossier. Are you familiar with Dossier? If you're not familiar, I'm about to get you familiar with Dossier. If you don't already know, Dossier is a fragrance company that creates luxury scents, but at a fraction of luxury prices, because I don't know if you've ever bought a bottle of luxury perfume, but it can cost anywhere from 50 to hundreds of dollars. How dare they? And Dossier perfumes cost anywhere from $29 to $49, and they can offer you bulk deals, or if you buy three or more bottles, you can get up to 25% off and free shipping which is just like a really good deal for those of us who are trying to save money without sacrificing quality, which is the life I try to live. Okay. Okay. So today I got the scent floral pear, which is inspired by Joe Malone's English pear and freesia perfume, which smells so good. And I also got floriental coconut, which is inspired by Tom Ford's Soleil Blanc et de perfume. Okay. Uh, but the best thing about these is that neither Jo Malone nor Tom Ford perfumes are cruelty free, but Dossier perfumes are. And if you don't already know this about me, that is a very big deal to me personally and ethically. These are the kinds of companies that I like to support. And on top of that, and what most of you will find most important is they smell so good. Like Floriental Coconut. How dare you? Who gave you the right to smell so good? Anyways, Dossier is offering members of the Brat Pack 10% off their purchase of their new favorite perfume with the code Bratterstein at checkout. And like, they're already so affordably priced that this just seems like a deal too good to be true, but it is true. So I take advantage of it while you can and make sure to use the code Bratterstein at checkout for your favorite new perfume today. The link will be down below in the description box as always. And of course, I just want to thank Dossier for hanging out yet again and sponsoring my video yet again. They are so tight. I love working with Dossier, as you guys know. And of course, I want to thank you guys for always being cool as hell and, and, and supporting any and all content and loving the sponsors. I know that some of you have already gotten your Dossier perfumes and are loving it, and I love that for you. And I just love you guys for being so supportive all the time. You rock. Don't ever change. So now that I'm done spreading the good words, the good word, the good word of Dossier, we can go ahead and get into this case. Now, this is a case I heard about years ago, and it's one that's been on my list to cover for a while, but it just hadn't come up for me yet. And sometimes just when the time is right, the time is right. I can't explain why. Just one day I was sitting there and I started having Kenya Monhe's name just popping around inside my brain. And I realized that, that this was the time where I needed to learn every single thing I could about her case. And once I know everything, I want to tell you everything so that you can have all the information that's in my head. So it's not just sitting there being wasted. You know what I mean? This is a case that will upset you. It's very tragic and it's very creepy. And it's the, situ the situation that happens here is something that I don't know about you, but I know I have found myself in personally. And it seems like the type of thing that many young women in particular have found themselves in. And it's very scary to think that things could go the way things did go for Kenya. And it's it's just so messed up. And, and I feel like there's also a lesson in her story. And that is that you really cannot trust a book by its cover. And you really have no idea what someone's true intentions are, no matter how nice they look or seem. With all of that said, today I'm going to tell you the whole story. And while I do, I'm going to be putting on a full face of makeup, hence the makeup in Morbid Makeup. So if that's not really your thing, thanks for hanging out this long. I hope you find a channel that covers this case in a way that you enjoy. But if you're on the fence, you're not sure how you feel, maybe stick around and you could be surprised by how much you like me. So come gather around and let me tell you the story of the tragic murder of 19 year old Kenya Monhe. Kenya Monhe was born in Honduras to her mother Maria when her mother Maria was only 15 years old. So still a little child herself. And honestly, when I think about that, it completely blows my mind because I am currently 
almost 20 years older than Maria was when she got pregnant and I'm currently pregnant. And the idea of being a mother to me, like a full on effing adult, is already blowing my socks off. So I cannot even imagine how difficult that was for Kenya's mother. In April of 1993, when Kenya was just over a year old, her mother Maria left Honduras for the United States, leaving Kenya with her grandmother. It was the hardest thing Maria ever had to do, as I'm sure you can imagine, but at only 16 years old, she was literally still a child herself. And the idea of trying to move to a totally new country and try to build a safe life, that's already an impossible sounding task, even without having a baby in tow. So she left to try and go and get a steady life started, set up shop, save some money, and do what she could to make the best life for her and her daughter, Kenya. While in the US, Maria met a man, Kenya's soon to be stepfather, a man named Tony. Maria and Tony met and presumably fell in love and actually had two children together, a girl named Kimberly and a boy named Anthony. So in 2004, when Kenya was 12 years old, she came over to the US and she had a lot to come home to. It was just a big old happy family and it was a warm reunion. Kenya was so happy to meet her new siblings and her new father and she connected with them immediately and they were so happy to have her home and Kenya wasn't the type of girl who like was pissed off because she was coming home to this whole new family and feeling left out and not liking her husband her mother's new husband she was like all about it and her and Tony were super super close and she was the type that went up to him and was like well let's not go with like stepdad and stepdaughter let's just call each other daughter and father and he loved that and they were immediately close and that whole interaction with Kenya and Tony happened just weeks after her being back. So it wasn't like a thing where she had to work at being comfortable with him and loving with him, loving with him, loving him. It was an immediate thing for them. And he said that he just loved her like his own daughter and that Kenya, when she came, she loved her siblings and was particularly close with her little sister, Kimberly, the two becoming immediate best friends. Kenya was a really good kid growing up. She wasn't problematic. She wasn't rebellious. She was even the kid. She's, she even started Sunday school classes, right? She started the class and she was the teacher. She was super smart and good in school with a dream of being a director or a producer or working in broadcasting when she grew up. And she was a very beautiful girly girl, loving makeup and the color pink. And her room was even all decked out pink. She excelled in her classes at Cherry Creek High School. And after graduating, she enrolled in a local college in Denver where she was studying broadcasting. Kenya was extremely kind and caring and she made friends easily. She had an active social life, but also enjoyed relaxing at home with her family. She was just a big ball of life and love at the small stature of 4'11 and a weight of only about 100 pounds. So now we're fast forwarding to March 31st, 2011. This is in Denver, Colorado. And 19 year old Kenya Monhe is going out for a night on the town with a big group of girls. They're planning to go out, drink, dance, party, all that jazz. Sadly though, this night of fun that she had in her mind would not turn out as planned and Kenya would never come home again. The plan for the night was her and her group of friends, a lot of which were underage with her, because remember she's 19. They had their fake IDs in tow and they were going down to downtown Denver to the area where there were lots of bars and clubs and they were going to use their fake IDs to get in and they were gonna just have a good time and be, you know, teenagers at a bar and a club. And they had a plan, it was like a bunch of different girls and they were taking several different cars and they were all gonna meet up at the same location. And Kenya ended up riding with some girls that she didn't know super well. They were like kind of friends of friends, if you know what I mean. They weren't her close friends, but she got in a car and she headed off with them that night. Upon arrival at the club that Kenya and all of her friends agreed to meet at. So, okay, you know how I said they came in several different cars? Well, apparently some of the friends had gotten there earlier in another car. And I don't know if these friends were 21 or if they had better fake IDs, but they were let in. But when Kenya and her group got there, they, the bouncer like looked at their IDs and he was like, get the fuck out of here, children. Like, it's clear you're not old enough. It's clear these are fake. And they were turned away. So the girls decided like they still wanted to have fun. F it, let's find another club that will likely accept us. And that's when they decided that they were gonna head to the 24K. So I'm assuming 24 carat lounge. Now, the reason, so Kenya's friends who had gotten into the first place were like her closer friends. And when Kenya didn't show up, they just assumed that she just wasn't coming at all. They didn't think that she got there and was turned away. They just assumed that she just bailed and they went on having their night, not even worrying about where Kenya was. 
At the second location, Kenya and her friends found success. So they get into the club, they go in, they find themselves a table that's going to be like their command post. This is where they're going to leave their stuff. This is where they're going to meet up later, you know. Maybe, if you've been to a club, you do that. You pick a spot. This is like our spot. And immediately Kenya was like, but guys, I just want to dance. Not really, but she did like want to dance. So she took off her jacket. She put her purse. It had her cards, her phone, her keys, everything in it. And she left at the table and she went out and she got on the dance floor. And before long, Kenya and some guy had started dancing together and they were just like having a good time. Breaking it down all on the floor. Shake that. <sighs> Give me some more. Shake that all on the floor. That was Kenya. Now, a little after 1 a.m., Kenya and the guy that she had been dancing with actually ended up getting kicked out of the club for being overly intoxicated and acting like a bit of fools. They were acting a little foolish on the dance floor. So they were actually thrown out. And Kenya's friends knew this. Why they did not follow her, I don't know. But Kenya was thrown out without her jacket without her purse. So she had no keys, no phone, no cards, nothing. She was just out on the street with this guy. And all she was wearing was like a really short skirt and red heels. And Kenya's dad in an interview, Tony said that he believes that Kenya might have been drugged because of her level of intoxication, because the girl she was with claimed that she did not drink more than them and that they were still in control of their faculties. It was never proven that this was true. There was nothing in her talk screen that showed anything like this, but that was his theory. But either way, Kenya was thrown out of the club. These girls who weren't her close friends didn't go after her and she had none of her belongings. So now we're fast forwarding to the, the next morning and Kenya's close friends, the ones who had gotten into the club, realized that one, Kenya had never shown up at all, which wasn't totally on brand for her, but they weren't worried at the time. But two, now no one could get a hold of her. So one of her close friends actually reached out and contacted Kim, Kenya's little sister, and was like, hey, have you heard from Kenya? What's going on? And this is when Kim was like, no, no, I haven't heard from her at all. No one has. Now, this wasn't totally weird because at the time, Kenya actually didn't live at home. She was living with her boyfriend, who was not the guy from the club, but she did have a boyfriend who she was living with. And now I don't want to hear anything down below about her dancing with somebody who wasn't her boyfriend, because guess what? It has nothing to do with her being killed, and it's not necessary. You don't have to say every thought that pops into your brain. I don't know if you knew that. Most of you are cool. But some of you, I've seen some of you, you know who you are. So now more time has gone by, and now Kenya's boyfriend, the one that she lives with, realizes that one, Kenya has never came home, and two, now he also cannot get a hold of her at all. And I don't know if he called and he spoke to her close friends, and that put him into a panic mode, or if generally speaking, Kenya was incredibly easy to get a hold of, or if her routine was so predictable that her not coming home was just enough to put him into an immediate panic, but he did go into panic mode, and he called her sister Kim as well, and asked if, you know, she was there, if she had heard, and that's when now he realizes that none of her family knows where she is. None of her friends knows where she is. And now her sister knows that none of her friends know where she is. Her boyfriend, who she lives with, doesn't even know who she is, who she is, where she is. And everyone goes into panic mode. Real quick, I feel like my speech is not coming out proper. And I'm, I have a fucking swollen ass taste bud on the side of my tongue. And it hurts so bad. So my mouth seems a little like, <laughs> like tongue drunk, tongue drunk. That's why. And I'm so sorry. Can your sister calls her parents, tells Tony, tells her mom what's going on. Her mom calls Tony at work to tell Tony what's going on. And at first, Tony actually thought that Maria was fucking with him because it was April Fool's Day when this was all happening. But quickly he realized that she, she wasn't joking, something was up, and he took a half day from work, like off of work, so that he could put in some legwork and try to figure out what was going on. And he started with Kenya's friends that she was out with that night. He contacted them. He's like, what the fuck? And at first the girls were like reluctant to tell him everything that was going on because he didn't want, they didn't want Kenny to get in trouble. They didn't want to get in trouble themselves. I mean, they were doing something illegal by using fake IDs and going to the bar, the club, the club, you know, but eventually he did get them to be honest. They told him everything that happened and they ended up coming over and bringing Kenya's belongings back. And that's when her dad was just like kind of freaking out because he thought this was so, so out of character for Kenya. Like she wasn't one to go out and party. Who is this girl you're, you're referring to? But then, 
she wasn't really open to like telling her dad about her doing illegal activities and partying. When he talked to Maria and Kim, they were like, yeah, okay, she does this. She's always done this. She's done this for years. It's no big deal. And he was like, what? Like he was blown away, but you know, dads, dads are protective. She didn't tell her dad, but her mom and her sister knew that this wasn't uncommon for her. Not the disappearing, but the going out and partying thing. So immediately Kenya's family tries to go to the police and report her missing, but you know what they say? She has to be missing a full 48 to 72 hours before we're gonna do anything. And they're like, well, that's really annoying and stupid as most of us would think. So they are just kind of left to their own devices to figure out what to do. So they go home and they just kind of like wait and hope that they'll hear something or she'll show up. And by nightfall, they're just like, what the fuck? Like this is a full day that she's gone. And it was after that that things got kind of weird. So as I said, the girls that Kenya was out with that night had brought Kenya stuff back to her family, which meant that they had her phone. When they had gone through her phone, they had read all the text messages, they had looked at everything coming in, and there was a bunch of texts coming in from her friends and her boyfriend, like, where are you? What's going on? Where are you? Where are you? But she hadn't responded to any of these. No text had even been sent from her phone since 11 p.m. the night that she went missing, and they had read all the texts that had come in, okay? But then at 7 p.m., April 1st, the night after she had gone missing, a text does come in to Kenya's phone that is now in possession of her family. So they receive it and it comes in, did I say 7 p.m.? It comes in at 7 p.m. and it's from a number that is not saved in her phone. And it says, and I quote, Hey, this is Travis, the guy who gave you a ride last night. White creepy van, wink face. Did you get your car home okay? So naturally, her family reads this and they're like, what the fuck, who is this? So they call, Tony calls the number back over and over and over trying to get a hold of him because he's like, this guy may know something. He saw her last night. Let's, we need to speak to this man. And the call go unanswered, unanswered, unanswered until the next day, the next evening. So a full ass day later, she's now been missing for two days. Kenya's phone rings and it's a call from that number. The number that was in her phone that texted asking if she got home okay. And on the other end of the line, when it was picked up, was a 31-year-old man named Travis Forbes. So Travis and Tony, you know, Kenya's father talk. And this is when Kenya's father informs Travis that Kenya's missing, that she never came home from the club that night, that apparently this guy saw her, and that the whole family is freaking out. So he wants to know from this guy, Travis, like, what happened? You saw her. What happened? What was the last thing you saw? And this is the story that he gave her father. Travis tells Tony that the night that he saw Kenya, he found her walking down the street, drunk and stumbling after she left the bar and that he was freaked out because she was talking to some ram random homeless man. So he pulled over and he asked her if she needed help, if she could use a ride and she accepted. He says that Kenya, when she got in the car, she was freaking out. And so he taught her some breathing exercises to try to calm her down. And once she was a little bit calmer, she asked him if he wouldn't mind going to the gas station because she really needed some cigarettes. So the two drove over to a gas station, but when they got there, they realized that the station was closed. But there was another man who was sitting outside the gas station smoking cigarettes. So Kenya was like, one second, I'm gonna go try to get a cigarette off this guy. So she gets out of his, his van, she walks over, she sits down with the guy. They start talking um, in Spanish, went back and forth. So he thought maybe they knew each other. And this is when Kenya tells him like, I don't need a ride anymore. I'm gonna go with this person. And that Kenya and this man just walked off together, hanging out, smoking. And that was it. And he was just kind of like, she's like, I don't need a ride. And he's like, I mean, I, I don't know you, like go for it. And she dipped. And that was his story. And that was the last time he had seen her. At this point in the conversation, Travis actually offered to meet Tony at the gas station where he had dropped Kenya so that he could talk to him, show him exactly where she, she was left, show him exactly what happened. So the two agreed to meet the following day. And as soon as Tony told his wife Maria that he was going to do this. She immediately freaked out. She wasn't a big fan. She didn't think it was a safe thing for him to be doing. So he's like, okay, okay, okay. If you're so worried, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring my gun. Okay. That's what's going to happen. So the next day comes, he grabs his gun and he heads off to the gas station to meet up with the last person to see his daughter before she went missing. And Maria was like, this is sketch as fuck. I don't like any of this at all. So as soon as her husband walked out the door, she rang up the police and she's like, hey, this is the circumstances. My daughter's missing. Da, da, da. This is the last guy that saw her, blah, 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 blah. My husband brought a gun. I don't think this is safe. So the police, upon hearing this story from Maria, realized that, yeah, she's probably right. This probably isn't like the safest thing ever. 
So they dispatch an officer to go to the gas station and meet Tony and Travis there to supervise, make sure everything goes smoothly. When Kenya's father arrived at the gas station and first saw and met Travis Forbes, he was immediately filled with a sigh of relief, actually. This guy did not look like anyone you needed to worry about. He didn't look like he could hurt a fly. He looked, he seemed like the kind of guy in a rom-com, right, who would have a girl over after meeting at the bar. They'd have too many drinks, so she would like pass out. And instead of doing anything sketchy at all, he would just like tuck her into his bed, kiss her on the forehead before going in couch surfing all night to make sure that she was safe. This is the way that this guy looked. An officer later said of Travis Forbes, and I quote, he could walk in a bar and probably strike up a conversation with 95% of the people in that bar. While at the gas station, Travis told Tony and the cops the exact same story that he had said over the phone that he had seen her walking, that he had picked her up, he had gone to the gas station, blah, blah, blah. And he even said that he had an alibi for that night, that after he had left Kenya at the Conoco station, he had gone to his girlfriend's house, a girl named Carrie Humphreys, and he had gotten there at about 3, 3.30 a.m., and he had been there until he left for work the following morning at 8.30 a.m. Police immediately didn't really buy Travis's story. They thought it sounded kind of like a lie, but they also had nothing to hold him on. So they decided at that point, like they were gonna head out. Everything was fine. They weren't shooting each other. It was not like a violent interaction and that they would just kind of keep Travis in their minds in case Kenya didn't come back home. Spoiler alert, she doesn't. Once police left that night, Tony and Travis kept talking and Travis started to cry pretty aggressively and like intensely just saying over and over that he wished he could have done something more, that he wished he had stayed with her, that he wished he could have protected her, blah, blah, blah. And he was like really, really worked up, which Tony found odd because Tony wasn't even crying at this point. Like she was just missing. There was nothing to be this upset about, but maybe that's just one thing about him. Maybe this is just a real emotional guy. However, if that was the only thing, maybe her dad could have like let that go, but it wasn't the only thing because the two finally finish up their conversation and they go to say their goodbyes. The two grasp hands to shake as, as men do saying their goodbyes. And that's when Tony realizes that Travis is fucking trembling aggressively. Like he couldn't see it from the outside. He looked cool, calm and collected. But as soon as their hands grasped, he could feel this man just fucking shaking. And he said at that moment, he knew that he was shaking the hands of the last person to see his child alive, the person who probably ended her life. And at this point, he didn't even know that his daughter was dead. So police went back to the station after meeting with Tony and Travis and thought to themselves that like Travis just didn't really seem like he was on the up and up. So they run his information and that's when they find out that he's a 31 year old man. And as a profession, he rents out a space at a bakery where he makes his own homemade granola bars. Sounds wholesome, right? Except it wasn't because they also pulled up a pretty extensive criminal record. And at the time that Kenya went missing, he was actually on probation for domestic assault. An officer Estrada said of Travis's criminal record, and I quote, it started with burglaries, theft, and moved on to harassment and assault. It started to get a little more severe every time. Estrada has said that he believes it was the thrill of the escalation that got Travis committing more and more violent crimes each time. And he had even spoken to two of Travis's ex-girlfriends during the investigation, and both girls described an intense change in the sex life they shared with Travis, and in not such a cool way. Estrada also said of Travis's storytelling abilities, and I quote, Every time he talks, he has something to cover up. He knew what he was doing. He had a story and excuse for everything. So time went by and obviously Kenya still never came home. So finally her family is able to file a missing persons report. And this is when police really, really start investigating this case. And they start with Travis since he is obviously the last person who had seen her and it seemed sketchy from the beginning. So they go to the place where he works the bakery, where he had rented out a space for his granola bars. And while there, he was just like super interested in talking to police. He was a very, very chatty guy. He reminds me of the guy, what was that guy's name? 
I can't remember the guy's name. The guy who murdered John Altinger, the, the Dexter killer, that guy was super chatty too. And that is how Travis was. So police talk to Travis there at the, the bakery for a bit and eventually they get him to agree to come down to the station and give an official statement. So he does, he comes down, he gives the same statement that he had told police and Kenya's family time and time again. And he tells the police about his alibi this time, about how he had gone to his girlfriend's house, blah, 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 blah. And the police even spoke to his girlfriend and she had corroborated this, this alibi saying that he was there at the time that he said, no big deal, nothing weird. But police end up looking into Travis's cell phone records and they find that that night he was nowhere near his girlfriend, Carrie Humphrey's house. So this was the first time police caught him in a lie. But hold, hold tight there. We're not quite there yet. On April 5th, Denver Police Detective Nash with the Missing and Exploited Persons Unit was assigned to the case. And he didn't believe Travis's story immediately upon speaking to him. Nash said of Travis's story of what happened that night, and I quote, I didn't believe him. Why would you take a girl to a closed Conoco? You could see from across the river that the Conoco was closed. When Travis spoke to Nash about what happened that night, though, he was super calm, super confident, looked Nash straight in the eye. He had a ton of information about anything that was asked. He, he had an explanation for, and he just could not trip this guy up. Nash said of Travis's ability to tell a compelling story, and I quote, he could tell you that he climbed Mount Everest, every detail about it, but he's never been there. So while police were doing their investigation, Kenya's family was trying to keep their hopes alive and they were going out and doing their own work, trying to see what they could find. They went all around and hung missing persons flyers anywhere they could think of that she might have been. And everywhere you looked, you could find a missing persons flyer of Kenya in the area. And they were just trying their best to keep their, their hopes alive. They thought, they really thought that she was alive out there. They thought that maybe she was being held somewhere and couldn't get away. And that's scary in its own right. But her father apparently was the one person who didn't really believe that. He didn't tell his family that because he had to be like the rock and let them hold on to hope. But at night he would go out and try to see if he could find her body. So with the evidence that police did have against Travis, they were able to get a judge to sign a search warrant, giving them permission to search Travis's van. And they go to execute said search warrant. And when they get there, they don't find Kenya and they don't find anything that belonged to Kenya, but they do find some things that lead them to believe they're probably on the right track when looking into Travis. So it starts with the, the exterior of the van. They search it and it looks to be relatively clean. Things look fine, except for like the wheel wells and the wheels, the tires themselves. There seems to be a lot of mud, debris, plant life. Like he was clearly driving off road in a more rural area. But when questioned about it, he says, no, like I wasn't. So they're like, okay, that's weird. It's definitely weird, but not as weird as when the police officers opened the doors of the van and were figuratively knocked on their asses by the smell of bleach. Inside the van, they found that the whole back of the van was clean, like and spotless man. He had really gone to town cleaning this thing from top to bottom. He had even ripped out and replaced the carpeting in the back of the van. And even though the, the back of the van was cleaned so meticulously, for whatever reason, the front of the van was left kind of a mess. There was still like fucking trash and like, you know, water bottle shit like that all over between the front passenger seat and the driver's seat. And they were like, that's kind of odd, right? Like it's super odd to clean so intensely the back of the van even replacing the carpet, but not touching the front of the van. So that, that struck officers as a little bit weird. And they really searched this van so meticulously. They even took the doors off the hinges, but they didn't find any DNA evidence um, because of the extensive cleaning. If there if it was there, it was now gone. And because of the bleach, it made it so they couldn't tell one way or the other if there had ever been blood in the back of the van. It was causing um, like inconclusive results when they tested for blood. So though police do feel pretty strongly that it is Travis, they do still have to follow up on his story and they start looking into this mystery man that Kenya walked off into the night with, this stranger with cigarettes that just like swept her off her feet. And when they look into it, they find that they keep running into dead ends. They're not finding any witnesses who saw this and there's no footage from the Conoco station to prove that this had even happened. 
So police get kind of desperate. They really want to try to find some footage of Kenya and Travis together. So they start looking in to surrounding businesses near the dance club, the 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 club where Kenya had been that night to try to get some footage of just like her, where she was, her and Travis together, something like that. And for a second, they think that they've gotten lucky because they do find some footage of Kenya walking with a man. But this man was not Travis Forbes. What the fuck's going on? Keeping you guys on the edge of your seats. Oh my God, can you believe it? I don't think they could either. So the man on the surveillance video was actually none other than the man that Kenya had been dancing with at the club that night that she had gotten kicked out with. So the surveillance video was actually from his apartment building and it showed him and Kenya going up to his apartment together. But she ended up leaving just a couple of minutes later alone and unfollowed. And later they actually found surveillance footage of her again later that evening at a hotel where she had gone in to go to the bathroom and she was still alone. So it appears that this man did not follow her out of his apartment. Police even do question this man and his story completely lines up with what the the footage showed that they had gone back to his apartment together, that he had, you know, invited her in, that she was apprehensive, but she went for a second. But once getting inside, she quickly was like, you know what, I don't want to be here, probably because she had a boyfriend. She realized like, this isn't, this isn't fucking cool. I mean, that is just me speculating, but I can just imagine being in that situation. And she immediately left. She didn't want to do what she was doing and she left. And so his, you know, account of what happened lined up perfectly with the footage from the surveillance camera. So even though they investigated this and they investigated other leads, all their leads kept bringing them right back to one place. And that was to Travis Forbes. So they tracked Travis's cell phone activity and it showed that after Kenya went missing in the crucial hours, his phone had pinged about 30 miles away. So about an hour away with traffic in an area he had no business being in, in a small town called Kingsburg. One question, he said that he was just delivering granola bars for work though, but police looked into this and could not find that he had any clients out that way. They went to the town and did a preliminary search of the area. The area was searched on foot, horseback, with helicopters on ATVs. They searched ditches and waterways and even a nearby dairy farm looking for anything, any evidence she was there, any disturbed earth or any human remains. Though nothing noteworthy was found, police could not shake the idea that this area was crucial. And during the next five months, authorities would search this area 15 times for Kenya and always find nothing. It also came to light during the investigation that Travis may have been stealing money from the bakery he worked at. Now let me explain why this matters at all. So Travis's boss realized that some money was being stolen from the bakery. So she's like, you know what? I got some fucking cameras. I'm gonna go check those cameras and see what's up. And that's when she realizes that the cameras were unplugged. So she was like, huh, whoever unplugged these cameras is stealing my shit. Let me figure this out. So she puts in the tape. She rewinds the tape because genius and she sees Travis, but she sees Travis doing something a lot more sketchy than stealing money. She sees Travis come into the bakery with yellow rubber gloves that went like all the way up his arms, which is already weird because he never wore those for work. And he was wheeling in his granola cooler, which was like this big white cooler, but the cooler was taped shut with black duct tape. And he wheeled the cooler into the freezer and left it there. Again, this is something he never did. And this is the day after Kenya went missing, by the way, is when this footage was from. Okay. He's then seen coming back into the bakery with a roll of carpet, the carpet that he had removed from his van. And then he's seen going back out of the bakery with what looks like a bottle of bleach. And his boss is like, fuck because she knows of his um, involvement and his proximity to the Kenya Mon Mon Hay case, Jesus. And so she immediately is like, oh fuck and called the cops. Oh, oh, and on top of that, police had spoke to like people in neighboring businesses around and it was reported that Travis was seen right after Kenya went missing, freaking taking items, putting them in a large barrel and burning them on the bakery property. So police take this barrel and they go to check it, but everything in it is far too degraded from being burned to be useful. When asked about his activity on the tape and everything he was doing, he just explained everything away. And officer Natch, Natch, Nash said of his ability to lie essentially. And I quote, 
He just explained everything away. He had an excuse for everything. The barrel, the cooler, everything. So now, for whatever reason, Travis decides that his best course of action now is to speak to the media because reasons. So in mid April, he does an interview with a local like news station and he just goes on talking about how he was just this good Samaritan who did, who just tried to help a drunk girl. And then this happened and now this was in his life and this was so horrible. Um, but police believe that the reason he actually went and did this interview is because he wanted to kind of talk to people who may have more information on the case than he did like reporters and try to get intel on everything that they knew. And another thing that was super, super weird about this interview is that literally, okay. <laughs> During this interview, he pretends not to know Kenya's name, even though he'd been like the person who was so affected by it that it was crying and it met her father it was like their prime suspect. He, he didn't, he didn't know her name. Like what was her name again? Uh, Kenya? Kenya, you dumb fuck Kenya. So after giving this interview, Travis actually like straight dips for a while. And like for a bit, police don't even know where he is and assumed he was on the run, but spoiler alert, he was in Texas. And the way they ended up finding that he was in Texas is because somebody there called the police on him because he just can't seem to keep himself out of trouble. Just crime after crime. If you fall, I will catch you. I will be waiting. Crime after crime. Anyways, the cops are called because essentially what happened is Travis borrowed a car from this girlfriend that he had. Girlfriend or lady friend. I don't know if they were dating. It's a lady and it was her car and he borrowed it and then he just didn't come back. So he essentially stole her car. So police pick him up and they actually arrest him and take him back to Colorado for the, the, for stealing the car. But then unfortunately when he was there, his friend decided not to press charges. Cause she was like, he's just like a really good guy. I shouldn't be mixed up in all of this. I shouldn't have said anything. And so she drops the charges, but even though they had to let him go before they did, since they did arrest him, they did take some helpful things like his fingerprints and his DNA. Now, what do you think the, first thing is that Travis did upon being released from police. If you guessed went on the run, that's a really good guess, but it's wrong. He actually went back to the Kingsburg area, the area where police had been searching where they had been suspecting that Travis had hid Kenya's body and he didn't do anything there, but he just went and visited. So police of course search again, but still find nothing. So anyway, the reason that police knew that he went back here is because upon him being released, they decided that, maybe they should keep some eyes on him because like he's flight risk and also he probably killed somebody. So they start tailing him. They're following him everywhere. And he literally does nothing. They follow him day and night. And all they do is they see him sitting there chilling, not killing. So eventually they realize like, he's not doing anything. We can't keep putting money into this case and alloc allocating all of our resources here. So they stop tailing him and they start putting their resources on other cases that are going on. And I don't know if he knew he was, being watched or if he just realized enough time had gone by that he could kind of start acting a fool again, but he does. And he starts prowling the streets again, kind of looking around at some ladies being a little creepy. And he ends up relocating to Fort Collins, which is a municipality in Colorado where his father was from. Fort Collins was like a party town, a college town, a bar hopping area. And it was here that on July 5th, it would become clear to police what kind of predator they were dealing with. This is because firefighters were dispatched to the home of a young woman named Lydia. The home was completely swallowed by fire and Lydia had narrowly escaped this fire by jumping out of a second story window naked. Now, <sighs> Lydia was in really bad shape. Um, and not just from the fire or the jump from a two story window prior to her jumping from that window. Lydia had been beaten like horribly to the point, like she, her body, her face, she was shattered in a lot of ways. She had been strangled and she had been raped. And then her attacker had covered her and her whole apartment in bleach and then set the place on fire before leaving. By the time she had jumped out of the window, luckily firefighters and police officers were there. So she was immediately rushed to the hospital. 
This poor girl did survive, fortunately, but she was in such bad shape. She ended up having a stroke and was put into a medically induced coma that lasted for over a month. And it's so messed up because she had, she had literally just moved to this area four months before she was attacked to be so new in an area and then have something like this happen to you literally after just being out celebrating the 4th of July. Like that's so fucked up. For about six weeks, Lydia had to undergo intensive rehabilitation with a bunch of physical therapy. And she even had to learn to speak again. And fortunately, if you can like use that word here, I don't know, but something good did come out of Lydia's attack. And that was that she had really fought off her rapist. And in doing so, she had gotten some of his DNA under her fingernails. So this was collected and sent for processing. And several of the detectives who tracked Travis for months credited Lydia with solving Kenya's case, calling her a superhero. So while this is happening, while Lydia is in the hospital recovering from her attack, um, officers both in Boulder and also in Fort Collins had actually connected. And I don't know who called who. I couldn't find clarity there. But either way, the two departments spoke to each other. And they realized that they both believed that Travis Forbes was responsible for both Kenya's death, or excuse me, disappearance at this point. And the attack on Lydia. And it's because of several factors that they saw as similar. In particular, they were discussing the fire and the bleach. One of the officers said of this coincidence, this connection, and I quote, there was silence on the other end of the phone. This was almost so freakishly similar. It has to be the same guy. So both forces decided that they should probably keep an eye on Travis and like really keep an eye on him this time, not like watch him and then stop watching him. Like really like can laser focus, watch this guy because he's, he's dangerous clearly. Um, okay. So a little under a week later on July 10th, a little after 2 AM police are watching Travis they are following him around and they see him and he's headed to an area. He rides this little bike into an area called old town. It's an area where there's bars, clubs, same kind of area where Kenya went missing and he got there at about 2 AM. So it's when the bars are closing. So why is he going? Probably to pick up on ladies. At least that's what police are thinking. So he goes as the bars start opening up and people start running out, ladies coming out all drunk and stumbling in the streets as we do. Uh, he starts like peacocking, you know, making his presence very known to the ladies in the area. And it does work. And some women come over. He's got this kind of look to him. He's not my type, but I could see sure that if you like those blue eyed boys, sure. He's what you would be interested in wanting to talk to after having a couple drinks, I guess. So some girls come over, they start talking to him. He gets their attention. And one girl really stays and talks with Travis and is there having a conversation with him for about 30 minutes and cops are watching this happen. And then they start walking off together and cops are like, Hmm, maybe we should do something because they're headed towards a dark neighborhood. So police follow them for a couple of blocks and then they realize, okay, we need to do something. So they pull over and they stop the couple. They separate them. They start talking to him. They question him and they they're talking to Travis specifically and they ask him like, Hey, what's your name guy? And he says his name is Travis Kennedy not Travis Forbes, which is his actual name, but they're not letting on that. They know who he is. They're not like really Kennedy. Cause we know who you are. Motherfucker. Like they just like, let him go. They're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. They let him go by, by, but by, whoa, English. But by this time, the woman had already walked off. So she wasn't in any danger anymore. So please keep watching. And they watch him go back to his bike where he changes his shirt and he puts on a hat and then he goes back out for whatever reason to start talking looking for women again. Like, why did he change? That's weird. It's a weird thing to do, Travis, but sure, why not? And they see that he's following a drunk girl, not talking to her, just following behind her lurking. And she's about to walk into a dark area as well. And they're like, you know what? This is sketch as fuck. Like we, like this guy, like, what are you doing guy? You're changing your clothes. So that what? So we don't know who you are. And now you're following this girl to do what? Try to kill her. So they pull over and they arrest him for giving a false um, identity because that is illegal. You can't do that. So here's where things get crazy. It's like a movie. Okay. It's not a movie. This is a real story, but this is where it's like, so what, like, what are the odds that it feels like a movie? So they've got him in custody, but I mean, it's just for giving a false name. So he's not going to be there very long. And he's about to be released. Like he's next in line. He's about to walk out that door. And that's when police get the results of the DNA test that was taken, the, the DNA that was under Lydia's fingernails, they had tested it. The results came in, boom, bang, boom, Travis Forbes. So he's about to walk out and they're like, <laughs> actually sit the fuck back down. And they book him for attempted murder and arson. And it's at this point that the officers call 
Kenya's family and they're like, listen, and they tell them the whole story. And Tony, her father's like, listen, just cut a deal with him. Do whatever you have to do so that we can know where our daughter is, so that we can bring her home. That's all they cared about. They just needed their answers. So police sit down with Travis and they're like, listen, bro, like, come on, listen, we've got you on attempted murder. Your goose is cooked. Like we got DNA, you're fucked. You're going down for this. Just, just tell us what we want to know about Kenya. We can make a deal with you. Tell us what you want. We just need to know what happened where we want to give this family some peace. And this is when he tells them that he will give them a confession, but he has some stipulations. And his main one was that he doesn't go to prison labeled as a sex offender. So they agree. And at first he like goes back and forth and he like reneges on the, um, the agreement at first and like, what the fuck, bro. But then he guess he, he must've like thought about it for a second and been like, this is literally the best, the best deal I'm going to get because I wouldn't be going to prison for either of these attacks labeled a sex offender and sex offenders aren't going to do so well in prison. And I'm going to prison regardless. So I better take them up on this offer. So he finally agrees that he will give them a full confession and he will lead them to Kenya's body, but that he wouldn't go to prison labeled as a sex offender. Oh, and the death penalty was taken off the table. After confessing and the deal being made, Travis gets in a car with officers to head out to recover Kenya's body. And where was she? Same place that his phone pinged, the same place that he said he was just delivering his stupid granola bars, the same place that police had freaking searched time and time again and found nothing, Kingsburg. And so they drive and they're heading over there and he's a little chatty, a little chatty, you know, pretty light. But as they get closer and closer, um, to the location, which by the way, was only half a mile from where they had been searching. He starts to freak out. He gets real quiet. He starts breathing hard. He starts having a little attack there, but they get there, they get out of the car. And before pointing investigators in the direction of where Kenya was buried, Travis just lets out this weird animalistic scream. Travis said of his crime against Kenya. And I quote, I didn't pick her up to kill her. I didn't pick her up to rape her. None of that was in my head. None of it was premeditated. Travis's account of what happened that night is as follows. He and a friend were driving around in his van when they saw Kenya stumbling around on the ground, talking to some homeless man outside the 24 carat lounge. So they pull over, they ask her if she needs help and um, they pick her up and they try to actually get her an Uber apparently to her, her apartment with her boyfriend, but they're unsuccessful. Or I don't know if it was an Uber or a cab based on the timing, probably a cab. Uh, but my brain says Uber because 2021, you know, anyways, they, um, go off with her and he goes and he drops off his friend first, leaving just in Kenya alone together in the van. And he says at this point, Kenya had passed out in the van, um, because she was drunk. So he pulled over, he climbed on top of her and he tried to rape her. But in the process, she woke up and began fighting him off. So he strangled her to death. He says that he then drove around for an entire day with Kenya's body in his van, trying to figure out what to do next. And that's when he decided that he was going to store Kenya's body at Debbie's bakery. So he took her body and he put it in that granola cooler. And he says that he had to like really like slam down on it because she, her body was in rigor. So her arm was like, it's gross. He, he got her in there and he duct taped it shut with black duct tape. And then he stored it in the freezer at the bakery. He then cleaned out the entire back of the car um, with bleach, replaced the carpet, all of that while he figured out what, he, where he was going to dispose of her body. He then drove to Kingsburg, about 40 miles from Denver, where he dug a shallow grave under a grove of cottonwood trees near Interstate 76. On returning to the bakery, Travis cleaned the inside of his van again with bleach and burned everything Kenya had touched in the 55 gallon barrel. Travis pled guilty to first degree murder, saying of his crime, and I quote, what I did was horrible and cowardly. It was a mistake. Please remember me. Remember me as I was, not as the monster I have become. No, no, we will not do that. Kenya's body was found about four feet deep, taped into a fetal position and draped with a plastic tarp. Her cause of death was undetermined because her body was too badly decomposed to determine how she died. Her feet were skeletonized and part of her body were pretty decomposed. I mean, she had been out there for five months. The autopsy report said, and I quote, while the cause of death remains undetermined, the manner is ruled a homicide. 
while Nash drove back to Fort Collins um, after going out with Travis and locating Kenya's body, uh, he saw Travis looking at him in the rearview mirror, and then Travis asked him, and I quote, Are you happy, Nash? Are you happy you found her? Are you happy you got her back? Travis also pled guilty to the attempted murder of Lydia Tillman, and he said of this crime, and I quote, Why did I do this? I have been searching for that also in my heart and soul. I think we commit violent acts because deep down we find hatred of ourselves. I'm so thankful that Lydia Tillman survived, because if I hadn't been caught, I probably would have done this again, because deep down, I'm fucked up. I'm evil. Lydia recovered, but she had to relearn how to speak and to walk again. When she gave her impact statement, she wrote it days after waking up from her coma, but she would not read it aloud herself because she was still having trouble speaking from her jaw being crushed during her attack and her stroke. It ended up being read aloud by Larimer County District Judge Thomas French, and her impact statement said, and I quote, Travis Forbes, you caused me no harm. My spirit, my soul, and my mind remain untouched. May you find peace in this life. It was my intention to find the strength in my heart to forgive Travis Forbes. I did. I felt extreme anger towards him. Then I felt sad for him. He must be in so much extreme pain to so brutally hurt another human. I, I, don't, I, don't, know what I, I don't know what to say about that. But um, at the hearing, Kenya's mom, oh, don't do it, and Lydia hugged. And Kenya's mom said that it felt like hugging her daughter one last time. Kenya was able to be laid to rest by her family on September 16th, 2011, which was all they wanted. I mean, they, they wanted her back alive, but given the circumstances, this is what they were left with. At the funeral, guests were asked to wear pink and black for Kenya's favorite colors, and many guests read letters aloud that they wrote for Kenya. Her grave is inscribed in both English and Spanish, and it says, and I quote, I will love you always and forever. Love you, Dad. It also says, loving daughter, sister, granddaughter, niece, cousin, aunt. And I just want to say, isn't Tony like a fucking stand-up guy? I just, I feel like he was so involved in this. And he really was only in her life for seven years. And I, I'm not one to say that, like, as a step-parent, you're not a real parent at all. Because I think you are. But, like, not everybody steps up to the plate like that. And I just think that it's so, like... Tony sounds like a really good man, and I think that good men should be celebrated since we do often talk about so many shitty ones here. You know what I mean? Not that all men are shitty, but you know what I'm saying. Like, fuck. Stop killing us, guys. Be more like Tony. So as I said, um, some people wrote letters to Kenya that were read at her funeral, and I'm now going to read to you the one her sister wrote. And it's really sad. <laughs> and I just want to tell you so you can keep it together. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm saying see you later. I'll see you when God calls me home with you. I don't quite understand why you had to leave us all so soon, but God always has a purpose. I'm not going to look at this as a loss. I'm going to look at this as a gain. I've gained a guardian angel and one I know I can trust. Rest in paradise, big sister. See you when it's my time. I love you and you are always and definitely are missed. There is a memorial, like a, you know, cross that you put up where somebody died and they put one up. I don't, I'm not sure who did it, but somebody put one up where Kenya was buried. And there's like a photo of her and flowers left there as well. She had her whole life ahead of her. He just doesn't understand how many people he touched, how many people he left in his weight. Travis was sentenced to life in prison, plus another 48 years for the attempted murder. He says he does not know why he did what he did. He says that he's glad he got caught because he thinks he'd go on to do it again because he's fucked up and he's evil. He has an inner evil, this demon. He can't control it. Kenya's family established the Kenya Monhe Foundation to, and I quote, provide women and children in Colorado with resources, education, and funding to engage in safe, healthy, and productive behaviors and activities in the community. In addition, the Kenya Monhe Foundation will provide the families of victims of violent crime and families of missing victims with the emotional, physical, and financial support they need to survive the tragic event. So her family is clearly just like amazing people who took tragedy and turned it into something positive. And that's always mind blowing to me that when people want to go out and help other families, cause like they can't do anything now, 
right, to help Kenya, but they are doing something to be able to hopefully help there be less Kenyas, less girls where this happens to, and to help families who go through this as well, since they, you know, were pretty much going through it by themselves and they know how hard that is. Oh, and for like a fun fact in this case, if there is a fun fact, you remember um, Carrie Humphrey, uh, Travis's girlfriend who lied for him and gave him an alibi uh, for the night that Kenya was killed. Well, she was arrested as well, which good. <laughs> she was arrested on October 5th, 2011 on the suspicion of attempting to influence a public official. And essentially she just admitted that she did lie for Travis um, and that he wasn't with her and that she gave him a false alibi. And because of this, she was found guilty and she was convicted. She pled guilty to one count of trying to influence a public official, one count of perjury, and two counts of false reporting. She was sentenced to 60 days in jail and four years of supervised community service. She was, or no, no, 60 days in jail and four years of supervised probation. And she was given 2000 hours of community service and forced to seek mental health, health, mental health, mental health, health. So, uh, we love that for her, I think. And with that fun fact that my friends, is the story of the tragic murder of 19 year old Kenya Monhe. And I know that that's just quite a roller coaster of a case. I feel like, I feel like Travis Forbes was a very dangerous man. I know that just seems like kind of obvious, but I feel like if he had not gotten caught, if he had not inserted himself into Kenya's investigation by texting her, he would have gone on to hurt a lot more women. I feel like he, he was, a serial killer, like in the making, because he knew he was the prime suspect in Kenya's case. And he knew that police were on to him and he still couldn't even keep himself in control enough not to attack Lydia Tillman. And it reminds me so much of, um, Ted Bundy and the night at the sorority house where he was just like a fucking rabid animal who could not keep it reined in. And that's what it reminds me of. Not that he reminds me of Ted Bundy, but just that like animalistic urge and uncontrollable thing that's inside of him. That's what it reminds me of. And police even alluded to thinking that there might be more women out there. And Travis himself alluded to it also that there might be more women out there that police just haven't discovered yet that he's already killed. And he said of this, Travis said of this, and I quote, when everything comes to life, it's going to be horrific, horrendous. This case really just makes me think of how many times I myself have been hammered fucking drunk and just walking out alone, whether it be to try to get home or to be pissed off and like trying to get away from fucking whoever I'm with at the time, or just trying to go on an adventure and how easily it would be to have been Kenya. And how many times I have, I have accepted rides from strangers guys, like not now, never now, but as a, as a youth, I've done that so many times. And to just think, like, I can't, I, I wonder if you guys have been in the same position that this could have just as easily been us. Like, it just happened to be Kenya. She was just doing something totally normal, albeit unsafe. But that's kind of why you can't trust a book by its cover, because this guy didn't look like somebody who would ever hurt somebody. <laughs> what do they look like, you know? And you just have to remember that no matter how good somebody seems and how good their intentions may seem, you really don't know what anyone's capable of. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, thank you for remembering Kenya with me today because what happened to her is so horrible. She was 19 years old, an actual child at the start of her life and everything was stolen from her because she was doing something so normal and just came upon this monster who had bad intentions and that's it. And there's nothing that can be changed. And can't go back. You can't take it back. And she's gone forever. Everybody lost her forever. And that's horribly sad. Please don't forget to let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover down below. As you know, I have a long list of cases. And if you would like me to cover yours, you leave a case suggestion and I add your name to my list with your name next to it and your case. So I can give you a shout out if I cover it because I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. 
If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, I have all my social media linked down below for your convenience. I have an Instagram, I have a Facebook page, I have a Facebook group, and I have a Twitter. Uh, and I love to hang out with you guys there. I'm talking to you guys all the time. And I also, if you're curious, I always link everything I'm wearing down below, the makeup, the nail polish, the earrings, which are these so cute. My husband got them for me for Christmas. They're from Jacqueline Roxanne, if you're curious. Jacqueline Hill's um, new jewelry line, and I'm obsessed with them. So they'll be down there for you as well. Oh, and a link to my merch store in case you want to get this shirt or one of my other shirts, um, because I made some shirts because you wanted some shirts. So that's down there for you as well. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here. When you could literally be anywhere else in the world, that is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. At the very least, be better than Travis Forbes. Let's try to be like Tony. And yeah, that's it. Um, I hope to see you in my next video. Okay, bye.